What we know about fixated people is that protective security has little or no impact on them. They just see it as an obstacle. Often they're very careful, they've anonymised, they've privatised, they're operating off VPNs. Once we highlight where trolls lurk, I mean, they used to be underneath a bridge. Sometimes, somewhere, they leave a little snippet of information that enables you to piece together who they might be. You'll find that with a troll, the kind of behaviours that they express are similar to those who have what we call a violent inhibition mechanism. And this is very typical of psychopaths. I'm Dr Michelle Hunter-Hill, Chartered Occupational Psychologist, Director of the Occupational Psychology Practice International. The fact that these trolls can actually stay in the comfort of their home and impact individuals, it's actually a very powerful stance that they take on. That you're at home, it's very comfortable in your home environment, but yet you're still having such a terrible impact on the outside world. If you are subjected to an obsessional person or a fixated person, their fixation is pathological. That means that from the minute they wake up in the morning to the minute they go to bed, all they think about is you whether it's adoration or love or hatred. I think people need to understand that the threat that fixated people pose is very often seen as somebody who is just a crazy person. They've been researched quite heavily. What we know about fixated people is that protective security has little or no impact on them. They just see it as an obstacle. One of the main things when we're being harassed online, we feel as if we have no control. We have so much access to our devices. It means that we could just open up our iPad and see this horrible comment which can impact us straight away. What we have to do is recognise that we can exert control. We can simply close our device and just leave it for a moment. The psychologists that we use are, are both forensic and clinical psychologists. And they have decades of experience of dealing with these scenarios. They have decades of dealing with people in high stress environments. So first and foremost, you've got someone confidential to, to offload to or to rant to about what's happening. But then they also will give you the skills to put what's happening into perspective and then learn how to manage that and the anxiety that goes with it. But you need to learn the skills of how to do it, how to operate in that environment, how to recognize that actually there isn't a real threat or that the threat is on your mobile phone, not in real life. I'm Martin Dubby, I'm the Managing Director of Harrod Associates Limited based in London. We look at all investigations now with a cyber investigation vent. What can we learn about the situation? What can we learn of the disposition of the people that we're dealing with? And what we're able to do is go out there and harvest thousands, if not millions, of snippets and nodes of information that enables us to piece together who might be behind a defamation attack. You've got to identify the person in the first place. You've got to know the person you deal with. Often they're very careful, they've anonymised, they've privatised, they're operating off VPNs. But when they put out, literally, thousands of posts, Sometimes, somewhere, they leave a little snippet of information that enables you to piece together who they might be. Once we know who we're dealing with, you can focus in the lawyers, you can focus in the police. A particularly recent case where we were asked to look at a number of anonymous accounts stealing effectively from the client. We identified a number of them, but the principal target was still quite elusive. Someone who knew him called him by his real name. In subsequent posts, he then says about a member of his family who was involved in a cup game, and they won quite significantly. We were able to locate that game and identify the players, and literally went through the whole list of players with the guy's first name and located him using electoral roll to an address. So all these things tie up and enable us to make a positive identification and the legal team is currently considering criminal proceedings. Once we highlight a particular area in terms of where trolls lurk, I mean they used to be underneath a bridge, <laughs> 
but they do come from under that bridge and, and present themselves elsewhere. Clearly anonymity shouldn't be used to post extremely harmful content and there are ways of trying to get behind anonymous posters, both in terms of intelligence and investigations using open source technology to see whether someone has exposed themselves in another part of the internet that would allow you to identify them, but also using some of the legal remedies that we have at our disposal that enable you to obtain a court order to identify the person behind an anonymous campaign. Moving forward, into the next five, ten years of investigation work. The use of cyber investigation capability is going to be really vital to actually be able to go out and identify lines of inquiry quickly, cost-effectively, that focus the investigation on next steps and where do we go. Unfortunately, we have to recognise that trolling is a normal part of life now. It's a fact. It's what people do. As a result, you know, people are, are struggling and it's really impacting their performance. But because it's not considered to be a, a fact or a real issue as such, because you, it defies logic in terms of you cannot touch, taste or feel it. Having seen the damage that anonymous trolls and bots cause to individuals mental health-wise, family-wise, financially, job-wise, I mean, we deal with some really pressurised people who have been uh, subject to these attacks that causes real mental health breakdowns, and I think that's absolutely shocking. Why should there be a difference between online harassment and bullying as opposed to in-person harassment and bullying? We need to initiate change and put things in place to protect people.